Great, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for your time. I'm really excited to talk about this topic, to talk about how we measure embodied environmental impacts, what that means, and what it means particularly for both research and practice. So I'm going to focus, well, to lead off, um, I think I get to be in an interesting place of representing both practice, uh, discourse, and research at the same time. A lot of that is the function is of the firm that I work at. So at Karen Timberlake, we spend an awful lot of time delving deeply into questions of materials, construction, tectonics, um, and performance from a wide variety of attributes in a holistic way. We also operate with an ethos of design that sees design activity and agency as being empowered by analysis, not hindered by analysis. And I think that really fuels a lot of the question asking that we're able to do. So I'm not going to focus on any particular building projects. I'm going to really talk today and use this time to try to formulate some thoughts and talk about projects we've done in terms of this larger question of how we actually measure environmental impacts and what that does for us as designers. So a few quest more questions to throw out there that really fueled this inquiry within our firm over the last you know, five to eight years um, that we've been asking about our own buildings and that maybe you've been asking about the projects that you work on. And I want to make these questions as tangible as possible so we don't kind of float off into the realm of abstraction and kind of theoretical construct. So some of the types of questions I'm talking about are things like, what precisely is the relationship between energy efficiency measures in a building and total carbon footprint? What are the trade-offs between durable industrial products and bio-based materials? How do insulation types contribute to environmental impact across the project? What is the ramifications of all of that foam that we're seeing in a passive house project? How do I make sense of that? How do I calculate it? How do I talk about both the meaning and the narrative, as well as actually quantify those impacts? Can we better articulate and quantify the value of building reuse? And what environmental impacts will my building cause long after its usable life? So one problem that I want to put out there is that none of those questions can really be answered by tracking embodied energy. And it's early in the day. Others might take the stance as well. But from my perspective, the problem is that energy is not an environmental impact at all. It's a really poor proxy for environmental impacts. Megajoules are very mathematically convenient unit to work in. I think as architects and engineers, we're very comfortable with them. Um, some environmental impacts do indeed track with fossil fuel consumption um, and combustion. But all megajoules are not created equally. And I think very few people would argue against that point. So understanding our role as designers in shaping the environment demands that I think we be a little bit more sophisticated in our thinking about environmental impacts and energy. So while some environmental impacts do track here, I think that we can really embrace that complexity and figure out how to wrap back measurement into our design decision making. So fossil fuel consumption, from my perspective, is really not just a question of global warming potential. Land use transformation, habitat loss, water pollution, they are indeed difficult to quantify. We, we do know how to do that math, right? I'm going to talk a lot about that math today and hopefully not get too technical for folks. But the material decisions we make and really everything that we build carries environmental burden to terrestrial, aquatic, and atmospheric systems. And I think that what we're trying to do today, to some extent, is be real about that and see those landscapes of extraction, of production, and consumption simultaneously. So when I'm working on a structural schema for a project, when I'm thinking about specifying steel, I want to throw out there and posit a question that maybe I should be thinking about that landscape in which the steel is produced. Maybe that should factor into my design decision. So this is a Kyonan Steelworks in Tangshan. It's the largest steel manufacturing city in China. And the environmental impacts of that, and to air quality in particular, of that steel production will never be felt by the inhabitants of the buildings that you build. You can't measure it. You can't censor them in your building. You very, very much can track those impacts. And you can think about them as a designer, what that ramification is for your design. Because for the 5.5 million people who die prematurely every year from air quality impacts, that's quite real. And I think we have some obligation to grapple with those numbers and try to figure out, as imperfect as the science may be, what that means for us. So for better or worse, when I think about the wind turbines and solar panels and high efficiency MEP systems that are part of our green building toolkit, 
I do try to remember that rare earth minerals come from somewhere and that when we're driving a market for green building products, we also are contributing to toxic practices in often very far locations. So at Cairn Timberlake, when we began digging deeply into the practice of life cycle assessment, moving away from strict embodied energy calculations, we did it because we found it was much, much more useful in terms of fueling discourse and furthering our understandings from a quantitative framework and also from a narrative and a rich conceptual structural framework of what materials are, where they come from, and how they track across product systems. Life cycle assessment, of course, is a, a schema and a quantitative methodology that's been around for over two decades. And it's been kind of kept a little bit at a distance for architecture and construction. So it's been embraced heartily by, to a certain extent, product manufacturing, packaging, for sure, uh, alternative fuel use, um, personal <coughs> computers. Um, but architecture and buildings aren't really just complex products, right? We see them much more as dynamic systems where hundreds if not thousands of materials come together at a moment of construction, but they also continue to flow in and out of that building over its full life cycle. And I would argue that life cycle assessment, while complex and while a little bit tenuous and difficult to manage, creates an incredibly rich framework for tracking all of those materialistic flows, but also for helping us wrap our heads around these very questions of scale and complexity of the actual design objects that we put out to the world and our role in all of those systems. So since no one's defined life cycle assessment yet today, um, I'll do that. So life cycle assessment, as you know, for buildings and construction, we talk about it as tracking all of the material and energetic flows for a product system or a service across its full life cycles, so starting from resource extraction through manufacturing, on-site construction, op occupancy and maintenance, demolition, recycling, disposal, end of life. Um, and all of the flows that continue across that full system. So there's three problems for pursuing life cycle assessment in architecture. One, which I alluded to a little bit before, we have this bill of material problem. Inventory is incredibly challenging. Um, harnessing all of the details and the flows of what all those materials are, where they came from, really in my mind that's a data problem and that's a computation problem. Um, and those are two problems that are I'll say manageable. I'll talk a little bit later on about the conflicts there. Um, but there's strong methodological grounding for that type of accounting. The second big problem that we found as practitioners when we started engaging in life cycle assessment and where, when it was said over and over again that it was neither practical nor feasible to do so at the speed of a design practice rather than as a theoretical discourse was um, resolution. So if your modeling resolution is not of a sufficient scale to actually show your design iterations and your design decision, the model is not particularly useful. So we found that we needed to create tools that actually would work with the resolution of design and at the speed of design so that we weren't really just dealing in typologies and rule of thumb. And then third, we really felt personally, and I think this is probably shared by many, that life cycle assessment is not particularly useful if it's done at the end of a project, but that really it's an iterative process. Um, and that what we sought to do, rather than sit and complain about the agency of architecture, our lack of understanding, um, the limitations of education, was to say if this is a problem that we need a new tool, we should just make a new tool and figure out who we can talk to and how to bring enough folks to the table and computational knowledge and methodological accuracy to really test out and see whether or not we can do LCA in practice. <laughs> That's the largest I've ever seen this slide. It's a little audacious when it's that big. <laughs> so we set out to build this tool. It's called Tally. You can download it. You can use it. Um, it's been available for about two years now, and we're continuing to work on the tool. And what Tally does, I'll try to go through this a little bit more quickly, is it's a plugin for Revit that it integrates uh, LCA databases and a methodological framework into a building information model. So architects can track materials and services across the full design delivery workflow, uh, starting in schematic design, conducting incremental comparative life cycle assessments, all the way through the end of their buildings. So what the model basically does is it's connecting a lot of the information from your BIM model. Um, those material quantities are pulled into a tally Revit model. It connects to LCA databases. There's an incredible amount of translation that has to happen there to actually uh, retrieve the material quantities required to conduct high quality LCA. Um, and it produces a whole lot of reports and outputs that you can grapple with 
um, as a designer. Um, full building LCA tracks across all of the um, life cycle stages, which I'm not going to get into at this point, some which are a little bit fuzzier. Um, spending a lot of time right now working on construction data this week, actually. And I also like to think about um, LCA, particularly in design and construction, as a collaborative practice. So what we're trying to do is build tools that actually allow lots of, and require lots of different disciplines to be uh, working within the framework that they have the most information. So really trying to actively connect the knowledge of a particular project that comes from the architects and the engineers that are doing that specification, doing that detailing, understanding how the building is constructed, and bringing that together with the environmental impact data, with manufacturing data, et cetera, through this flexible framework that can actually feed back into academic research as well. Um, so I'll just flip through these. Basically, within Tally, you, uh, it harnesses a building information model. You define a scope of study. You isolate that study, the whole building, or a component of a building. You can compare options. Um, LCA is really a comparative optioning tool at its heart. And I don't have time to get into it, but what the tool is really doing is mediating between the complexity of required, as I said, to conduct a full building LCA where you're accounting for all the materials that really are going into that assembly, the coatings, the adhesives, the tiebacks, all of the mortar, the brick, and really figuring out how to translate what is a representation of design intent um, and the necessary abstraction of modeling and architectural drawing into that real material uh, quantities. So it connects to the Revit materials takeoff. You assign and create a bill of materials that are stored and cached parametrically in the model, uh, links to a database that's constantly evolving and upgrading. Oh, geez. <laughs> and it generates a whole series of reports. Um, the, you then have the output of the model is that it shows you, it allows you to kind of slice and dice those materials and assemblies in a whole variety of ways. Um, you're also seeing the mass by materials. And I won't get into them individually, but then we use the Tracy 2.1 EPA impact categories. So you're not just seeing energy or carbon, but you're also seeing all of those trade-offs between um, acidification, eutrophication, global warming potential, ozone depletion, smog, as well as those energy numbers that we know and love. Um, and as I said, really, this is the way we use the tool the most is as, a, is as a, an optioning tool. So I'm just going to go through these a little bit quickly because of the amount of time that I have. Um, but what I wanted to do is give some just really clear, not dig into the actual case studies, but try to elucidate the kinds of questions that can be asked when using a tool like this. And I've tried to pick some really, really basic ones because LCA can ask very, very, very sophisticated questions. But I think it's also at its most meaningful when it can scale. And I think that we need to do a better job of understanding not just what LCA results mean, but also how they can answer the everyday questions of design and architecture, and how this can be a methodology that can be used not just by the most sophisticated or research rich or boutique firms, but how this can be of service to all architectural designers and engineers in some form, whether it's this tool or some other better, better tool that hopefully comes along. So we can start to look at, this is just showing very quickly, the relationship between those embodied, um, the embodied carbon in this case of the building and operational carbon, uh, the pie chart being actually a terrible way to look at that material because it presumes a certain building life um, and doesn't really call into attention in quite the resolution that we actually know all of those different inputs that flow through the building. Um, just to note very quickly that if we care, if you do care particularly about climate change, I'm sure you're very familiar with this idea of while buildings will last for a very, very long time, uh, there's a certain strategic imperative to be thinking about those earlier carbon inputs, what we're putting into construction and buildings in the next 10 years and 20 years, which places even more importance, obviously, on the embodied carbon of materials like uh, excavation and concrete, aluminum, steel, et cetera. So we can start to see very rapidly what the contribution is of different materials, now just breaking up by CSI divisions for this building. Um, and focus right in, because we know for sure there's an awful lot of concrete in this building, there's an awful lot of steel in this building. Um, so a very, very simple question um, that can be asked is really, how can I easily assess the benefits of specifying low cement concrete mixes? Something we do all the time. We know as a rule of thumb it's useful. Uh, it's incredibly helpful to have some real numbers on that so that when you're making those decisions, you have the environmental impact figures right next to your costing, to your site utilization, to your constructability figures, et cetera. Um, so in this case, you could see really quickly through just a simple material sub, uh, substitution 
of upping the percentage of SCMs across the building, and we could zoom in on a piece-by-piece -piece basis within the model, um, we start to, in this case, drop the total carbon, embodied carbon of this entire building by 24% just by switching to a 50% SCM rate. So in a different kind of project, a small residential project, what I really like about running LCAs on these projects is that the materials are much more tangible and smaller in scale. And they've been really useful for us in terms of thinking about the relationship between embodied impacts and particularly in energy efficient buildings where a lot of those rule of thumb maybe go out the window. Um, and I don't see a lot of consistency between the specificity of projects. Um, a big topic here, so this is just showing a view zooming in on a more material by material basis rather than those CSI divisions, also straight out of the model, um, and zooming in here on just uh, isolating global warming potential and energy. So uh, this was one study that we ran um, looking at a change that had been made during CA for constructability reasons and a switch in insulation materials. And we were really curious, that switch was not made for environmental impact reasons, it was made for cost and constructability and material resources. Um, I wish I could have had some mycelium foam in here. Alas, not the case. Um, but the switch was made, that's what the two options are here. One was a as designed, one is an as built option. And you'll see primarily a big shift um, in Div 7. So what happened is that there was a switch um, to um, a foam insulation and a dropping of that mineral wool. And we were really interested not in fighting that per se, but really understanding what was the ramification of that change. Uh, so we re-ran our energy model, we re-ran the LCA model, and we were able to really understand what that meant for the building. Um, and the last quick case study I'm gonna show is for a, a project I'm actually working on right now. This is at Brown University, it's an engineering lab. And this was one where we worked through starting in what I would say is schematic design, but it's a IPD project, so we don't really have design phases. We were doing really rapid um, iteration of the curtain wall and cladding strategy for this building. So again, talking about multiple modes of analysis uh, running simultaneously. You know, we're in the room with uh, contractors, cost estimators, a facade consultant, maybe a glass consultant, though not in this case. Um, doing that multivariable assessment that's just part of design practice. And so what's interesting about this process to me is that it allows you to have those environmental impact figures at your fingertips and be at the table. Because I think what I find in practice is if you don't have that data, you really can't have this conversation. So in this case, what we were doing is working through a series of facade iterations. I won't get into these in detail, but started to just play out with those other variables. Um, how they compared and where we found room for optimization. Again, here looking at some of the insulation that was nestled within uh, an assembly that we thought a lot of the environmental impact would have a lot more to do with the cladding materials and the coatings and sealants. Um, but actually, again, some of the substitution and moving towards a material we weren't even really paying a lot of attention to a choice of insulation at SD helped us really think about this system differently. So in closing, I just want to talk about, you know, call attention to LCA, and I hope I've painted a picture of LCA as a tool that extends our capability to think as designers and to look well beyond the building site. So yes, LCA is complicated, it's imperfect, it's difficult to use, uh, it's difficult, interpretation is still a real problem in an industry and in a community that doesn't understand these topics very well. I think that's a charge we all need to be held accountable to. Um, but also, as a designer, I see no inherent conflict between striving to create beautiful, high-performing, enduring pieces of architecture, while also striving to understand the larger impact that our designs have on the world. So I hope all of you, especially those of you who are practice and care deeply about the built environment, take up this challenge as well. I find it not pessimistic, but incredibly optimistic that the built environment does not build itself. And every environmental impact that's out there is a design decision that somebody made. So I'll stop there. Thank you. I think this is a, um, a really um, going to be a very interesting conversation, and I'd like to thank um, Amal and, and David and uh, uh, the other presenters uh, for um, the invitation and for the uh, very provocative um, thoughts that they've uh, given us so far, and I'm sure will. Um, I'm going to uh, take a little bit of a, of a different uh, take on embodied energy, and I'll present um, three partial paradigms, and I, I would argue that probably the largest creative challenge today 
concerning embodied energy is, is not so much, doesn't lie so much in um, trying to figure out how to measure it, but still is fundamentally about how we imagine it, how we actually um, wrap our brains, which, which themselves are material, around this question. Um, I'm not going to talk in detail about um, these projects. I'm just going to refer to them in the background um, in, in what no doubt is going to be a, a whirlwind tour of these paradigms after I set up this, uh, this um, provocation. Um, but if you have any questions, um, you, can, you can ask them at KVA MADX, and um, we'll try to get back to you, um, or you can um, check out um, our, our website. So I want to start actually sort of at the very beginning, very quickly, um, just saying what, you know, what is um, the definition of, of embodiment or embody? Um, and that is the energy that's on the one hand incorporated, that's sort of constituent within matter, that's a state of material being, that's sort of a fact of nature, if you will. But it is also at the exact same time um, an expression or representation or projection of that state of being. That's a fact of culture. And I think material culture is very under-rehearsed um, in the history of architecture. So I think that the difficulty, um, the trick, is to understand these two parts of embodiment, um, that it's an incorporated thing that, that's sort of uh, inescapable, and that it's also a representation. But we have to, I think, understand these two things as one idea, that the natural world, um, and the social, cultural, and um, uh, technological um, built environment is really part of a single um, spatial system. Um, so all the materials that seem to, to sort of stand alone um, as an object of architecture or the built environment are part of a larger plot, a plot that is thickened in the case of architecture by all the circumstances of its constituent extraction how it comes into being, how it's transported, um, how it's assembled, um, and how it is taken apart, abandoned, and returned to nature over time in the short duration or the long duration. And this um, new um, embodied materialism that um, I'm interested in is really demanding a revision of how we, we think about, about materials. Um, matter is no longer a kind of passive um, inert substance that we can kind of control that's described in the kind of traditional mechanistic worldview, but it's actually associated with its own agency. Materials persist in time, they can leak, they can spill, they can be contaminated, and they can produce um, their own um, unpredictable results. So what I, what I would like to do is um, try to think about ways in which practice can um, challenge the way that materials come to us um, in their pre-processed forms and standardized dimensions. And I think that the palette of, of contemporary architecture is actually incredibly reduced. And instead of um, being able to innovate with materials, architects are asked to choose among standardized material commodities um, that are on the marketplace. And so I'd like to um, present these partial paradigms very quickly as a way to kind of reflect on the consequences of design on embodied energy. Um, how can architects engage embodied energy in ways that are actionable um, via design that open up um, new prospects? And I, and I want to preface this by saying that for sure um, these paradigms are, are in fact partial um, because they're incomplete and in many ways they're imperfect. Um, but the usefulness, I think, of the idea of the partial paradigm is that it's a way to advance knowledge about a problem when the contours of that problem are still uncertain. Um, so it's, it's an, an approach to uncertainty and risk in practice, um, which connects very well to the discussion that we just had. So these partial paradigms are about walls, factories, and nature. And I'll start with uh, unpacking the wall. Of all the things that we've sort of inherited from modernism, nothing is more intractable um, than or more resistant to change than the materiality of the, uh, the modern wall. And the modern wall has sort of been owned by a series of different um, corporations. You can see here that 
the Sackett uh, advertisement is saying this country is being plastered with the products of, of United States gypsum. Um, and I think that this, this, um, this definitely um, uh, uh, has, it persists today. Um, and one of the kind of simplest things, um, but most complex things as well, is for architects to, to challenge the wall. Um, what if we take back the wall? This is both a political um, and an architectural uh, proposition. In the soft house, um, the walls and floors and ceilings become a kind of enduring carbon bank that offsets the carbon footprint of the construction. The project recovers an older, forgotten technique of Brettstapfel, soft wood construction. Here you can see uh, dowels, which are hardwood, being inserted into layers of softwood, so the entire house is made out of solid wood um, in a very thick wall that can be built not by a factory, um, as in cross-laminated timber, not shipped, but made just a few kilometers away by really any uh, local carpenter. Um, and when the wall becomes a solid wall, um, the domestic infrastructure is displaced. It literally comes out of the wall. Um, and we developed a system where the consequences of unpacking the wall, or rather packing it solid with wood, um, released the infrastructure, allowed the domestic infrastructure of light, of energy generation, to, to be differently materialized as a series of textiles that move. I'll just let this little clip run um, uh, and say that when the wall became wood, um, it also is a way of, of questioning the passive house and exploring a kind of a lifestyle um, that shifts experiences and expectations of what it might mean to live um, in a passive house lifestyle. Um, sort of moving from a passive house to an active house um, and an architecture that moves in response to the environment. Um, you know, it's a little bit um, weird to see people living in the soft house um, when you make a house like that, um, and then you understand that people are living in it um, and, and evaluating how it works. It's really um, quite a, quite a, a sensation. Um, I'm going to move very quickly, though, um, and try to, um, try to um, get through this. Um, the second uh, partial paradigm is future factories. Um, and here, I think it's important for architects to think about um, inner city factories. How can we actually design the environment where materials are processed and made you know, in the heart of our um, most dense cities? Um, this is a project for the North Bennett Street School, which involves um, understanding how the, the uh, all the wood and material, or most of the wood and material that flows through these workshops has a prospect onto the city um, and is recycled back to the city in the form of wood pellets. Um, this project looks at a different kind of factory. Um, here we try to propose social media and we look at the kind of abundance of a natural material driftwood. And the factory is actually a social project of collecting this, of organizing this, um, and of um, in, in, uh, dipping it in insect food, which is a natural sugar, so that the wall itself, the thicket wall, can be made of wild wood. So we can have a material that can be naturally variegated and needs very little, um, very little energetic input um, to be used along bridges uh, and trails uh, in, the, in the city of Minneapolis rewriting the map and kind of thinking about how um, natural materials, almost untouched, could be incorporated into the larger systems of the city um, and its architecture. This project um, has to do with distributed factory. Um, it is a, um, a project where we thought very carefully about waste, where we think about um, how something very simple can be uh, given a structure, um, can be tied together. Um, and utilized. And you see uh, here um, uh, Kyle and Zaina are going to uh, be assembling this table. Um, and you'll see just kind of how simple it is. So that can we use the idea of um, distributed fabrication 
to create a new kind of workplace, one where uh, we have open making, not only in the fabrication of furniture, but also in the kind of, um, in, in the kind of specification of the architectural shell. Uh, we tested this using primarily just three materials, uh, paint, um, no VOC paint, and drywall um, to produce a zero carbon workplace that could be replicated um, in three different areas in the world. So the more that we try to reduce the palette of this, we just try to reduce the palette of this sort of interior uh, design, the more in a certain way that, that uh, we, we eviscerated this, um, the more sort of strong um, it became. So we are able to use local manufacturing in those sort of urban factories that I described um, in the Northeast, um, in Northern Europe, and also in the Hong Kong area. And last, I want to touch on sentient natures, um, the idea that natural systems themselves um, are a platform for technology. Here, we were uh, able to incorporate the flow of a river as a kind of an actor um, within the uh, East River Ferry Project, allowing um, the flow of the river, the flow of people who are arriving and departing from boats to trigger a series of interactive um, lighting that spoke to the speed, tide, and current of the East River. Another river project, um, a real-time river, really thinking about the materiality of energy itself, um, a very uh, low energetic um, photovoltaic material that can be made into an adaptable simple kit that provides light and, sells, uh, and charges a cell phone. Um, for use along the Amazon River in Brazil. So this is a project um, with um, many partners where we're trying to rethink the kind of larger east-west supply chains and substitute those with less carbon-intensive north-south um, supply chains. It's the first project, I think, um, certainly in, in, in uh, South America, where um, all of the um, infrastructure is made by hand. It's a different kind of making. We worked with local women maker communities. So the women who are making um, the soft infrastructure and the women who are using the soft infrastructure um, are both benefiting. And it's been used for um, land mapping. So there is a kind of a new equation, um, a new merging of agricultural elements, people, technology, um, and river as a way to kind of produce a real-time conservation. And then the last um, nature's, uh, sentient nature's example is some ongoing research with Michael Strano's group at MIT. Um, here we're looking at how carbon fiber nanotubes can be introduced into plants to augment their natural fluorescence. Um, plants are always fluorescing. They give off light. We just don't, don't see that light. Um, and the carbon tubes allow the plant to live and to become a kind of platform for technology. Um, and to give off light in the visible spectrum. Um, so what that means is that we don't need uh, people. Um, the plants themselves will be able to tell us um, how, how they feel, and they'll be able to kind of reflect contaminants in the urban environment, um, such as heavy metals uh, and, and carbon dioxide. So there'll be a way in which the plants themselves can signal to us um, how they are. Uh, I'll stop it there because um, I'm out of time, um, and I hope that we can continue the conversation in the panel. Thank you very much. Well, I guess I guess one thing that connects us is um, that we're both involved in practice in one way or another. Um, and I guess just to throw it open, um, the, there are many um, kind of carbon calculation tools out there that are kind of crowdsourced. Mm -hmm. Um, what's your what's your thought about about engaging engaging the internet and um, en engaging multiple voices and, in, and forums in terms of, of potentially um, crowdsourcing something that that Tally does? I think it's a it's a great question. I mean, I think we been engaged in a, a very hearty and animated debate about open source data and and open source platforms for both scripting as well as the data that you bring into such tools. Um, and I, th I think the way that I like to think about it is in terms of, um, of information and that there's a lot of pieces of information that come together in these types of models um, or other related forms of modeling. And that um, at the same time, there's, you're balancing um, 
questions of transparency, accessibility, legibility with quality, evenness, um, ac I won't even say accuracy, uh, utility. And so I think that when, I t when we talk about life cycle assessment and um, community organizing and, and opening up that platform for discourse, I think that there's a lot of possibilities for open data. I think there's a lot of possibilities for open programming. I think there's also a way in which different actors innately, because of the complexity of this modeling, have to come to the table. And so what expertise they bring to the table um, will be unique to those mm -hmm. actors. So our, our tool pulls from um, one of the largest peer-reviewed, third-party reviewed LCA, LCI databases in the world. Um, and that's part of our partnership with ThinkStep. That was really important in terms of really proving that a tool like this could be made, could be verified, and could be accurate. Um, there's also a lot of intelligence in the tool that draws from architectural knowledge, construction knowledge, mm -hmm. that LCA practitioners don't have, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's, that's the conversation that we're starting to have of what forms of information and knowledge come together in these modeling mm -hmm. platforms. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can throw it out to the, to the, uh, to the audience, but I think it's sort of interesting to, to sort of ponder, uh, um, you know, um, the utility of of a of, of tool of a tool, um, you know, is is climate change, you know, is 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 uh, carbon emissions really solvable by a single tool? Um, and if it is, should that tool be open sourced um, and shared around the world, et cetera? Um, and I'm just sort of thinking about lead the lead system, um, the lead system, uh, you know, and and of course, as pra as practitioners, we have to um, use all of these systems. Therefore, we've done many elite gold buildings. We've done passive houses, showed, etc. But you know, you don't want to fly under the flag of of, of these these kinds of um, measurement um, metrics. I don't think um, because lead has not really changed the practice of building. Um, mm -hmm. Lead has not really opened up. Um, new prospects for practice. It's allowed us to kind of incrementally adjust, um, adjust the, um, the, the, the the kind of worseness or, or betterment of, of, of the parts that we use. So I'm, I, I confess I'm, I'm a little bit uncertain that this moment in time is really the moment when um, we are when our best move is measurement. I think just wrapping our minds around what it is to be material today. Um, is, you know, is, is challenging. Um. Sure. I mean, I think a quick response to that is I, I think LCA has, has virtually nothing to do with LEAD. Um, I'm happy that LEAD is starting to actually reform itself to actually measure environmental impacts, which my, in my opinion it's never done. Um, and I won't go on a whole diatribe about the LEAD system. It's not even particularly interesting, I think, in this context. Um, but I think I... I will defend measurement. I think one, and I think architects have always been able to capture, part of our skill is in capturing complexity. And I think we actually do gather a lot of different variables mm -hmm. together and evaluate our designs. Right. And I wonder why measurement in this capacity, measuring environmental impact, causes so much anxiety mm -hmm. or ambivalence mm -hmm. for architects. Um, you don't hear the same um, critique of, there's, it's probably more uncertainty around energy modeling, mm -hmm. right? A very imperfect science, but many of us would argue one that's incredibly I mean, important. I'm for not our surprised. I mean, I'm glad that you're defending measurement, and we're going to have a whole session on measurement. And as a practitioner, um, what I'm saying is all of our buildings definitely need to be measured. Um, but I'm, I'm also trying to, to ask a question, and maybe we can have, have mm -hmm. some discussion and debate about this, um, about. Um, the, the kind of the kind of fundamentals of measurement does it does it or does it not presume that the the, the circumstances of the problem are already understood um, that that we are selecting within a a um, closed set of options and that we are not for example let's say unpacking the wall or considering a really wide range of materials that we could use um, we're, we're evaluating the um, you know the kind of conventional materials and trying to pick the lesser of the evil. Um, so, in terms of so, so on disciplinary terms, you know, it, it seems sort of interesting to, at this moment, and, and you know, in this conference, in the venue of this conference, to try to like open things up a little bit and to to speculate about um, what 
one can do while still being in practice, while still having you know, a full commitment to the making of things, which is very challenging when we're, when we're talking about um, embodiment and when we're talking about carbon, right? Because everything uh, has a, you know, things, things are, require uh, energy input. So it's a very challenging uh, discipline that we're in to try to, to try to corral and entice and grow uh, materials to do the different things um, that we would like them to do. So, I mean, I'm, I'd like to maybe, with that, throw it open to the kind of wider audience. Two things. One, you know, whether it's a problem of vocabulary, that people in practice now are not able, we don't have a vocabulary to talk about basically the opposite of fragile, the anti-fragile, that which, you know, gets better with stress or some kind of breakdown or issue, or if it is a question of expertise and that biology as in the last talk, is a bit of a black box, or some of these other processes are things that we to don't totally understand, or if it's maybe both. Um, and can you just get, can you just um, rephrase the actual um, question in that? Uh, yeah, sure. Mm, whether you think we don't have the vocabulary, and we should be, as architects, working towards that, mm -hmm. or whether we don't have the expertise and we should be looking for people and groups to partner with. I see, that's an interesting question. Um, I'd have to, I'd have to, well, for the purposes of this presentation, um, just to, to uh, respond to, to Zaina's question, um, I, I think that one of the incredible um, powers of architecture, and this is gonna maybe perhaps sound cliche because we take it for granted, um, but I do believe that the architectural imagination is an extremely powerful thing and it's very unique to um, the process of design. And you know, in a nutshell, um, we can imagine a future. In the case of KVA, it's, it's a near future. Um, and we can kind of send out a probe project, which is like a test bed. Um, and it goes out into the future. It, it, it imagines something that doesn't exist before, for example, the soft house. And then you, know, you, as architects, create a set of instructions to kind of get us from the present to that near future, which is also moving towards us at the same time. So it's like a boomerang. It's, it's a way of, of, of getting knowledge about something, throwing, throwing something out and getting knowledge back. And in order to do that, um, I think in architectural education, we, we, we really have to um, go back to the idea of the imagination in a really robust way um, because it's constantly being eroded by commercials and scripted things and sort of narrow choices and cl optimized clickers and you know boxes and things like that. So I'm not sure that it's about expertise outside of architecture, but it's certainly about fully using um, the expertise of, of architectural imagination to um, imagine, but that's not trivial and understand the, the kind of this condition of, of being, being in an embodied energy world where your own body is, is uh, a material chunk. You know, your own brain is a material chunk. Everything is a material chunk. And materiality is like a super fundamental thing that we share with everything else and this planet. So I'm, I'm kind of making the argument that um, embodied energy is like a new, ma new materialism um, that w we can kind of comp contemplate um, through architecture. And I, I agree with all of that. I think it's an excellent answer. Um, I think there's also, I also want to be a proponent for deep multidisciplinary work. And I think that the architectural imagination is profound. I think architecture does not and should not exist in a vacuum. And I think that when we're asking really complicated, dynamic questions, I think that collaboration is an incredible asset. And that I think imagination is not a substitute for deep expertise, and the two work in, are incredibly compatible. So at the same time that I think there's a lot of think, rethinking of architectural education that is happening right now and needs to happen, I think there's also an element in which by bringing, architecture cannot and should not do everything, right? And many, many innovations in some of the best projects and frankly the most fun projects I've worked on are ones where everyone does the hard work to build up their own shared vocabulary and then collaborate together and bring their unique perspectives to the field. And I think there's a really vital role for architects and planners to play in shaping the future of cities and design. But I also think architects need to um, experience a little bit of humility 
and also recognize all the brilliance that's around them and try to figure out how to actually tackle project problems collectively and collaboratively. The conundrum being that we're, we're in this material predicament, if you will, but at the same time we have to project and make a kind of an expression of it. That's, that's the whole crux of the, of the paradox of, of embodiment. Hi, uh, my name is Tim. Um, just a question, I think a lot of us are in the creative or design field. Um, we're into innovation, creating new things. I'm kind of interested in whether your um, research or any of the background in sort of the life cycle analysis um, talks about the reuse or reintegration of old materials or existing structures and buildings into architecture because I think we have an issue where there may be enough buildings in the world right now for everybody. It's maybe a problem of distribution, similar to the food system, where we know there's more than enough food in the world for everybody, but it's kind of more of a distribution problem. Um, so I guess as creative people, how do we grapple with sort of reusing some of the things that we already have? And, and I'm not sure, but some of the research you're doing, have you come up with any insights on, on the sort of pluses and minuses of reusing existing infrastructure and buildings and incorporating that? Sure, I mean, I think that's a great, it's a great question. I think um, the LCA community and, and practitioners within architecture and design have done um, a really poor job of talking about existing structures. I think there's some really interesting work that's happening right now. Um, I could point you to some papers and some studies. It's certainly a big question. Um, we do a lot of adaptive reuse and do a lot of work on historic structures and it, it's why I raise that question of value um, because I think value and his, the value of historic uh, fabric let's say is a is a really complex question that's that's not oh it's never just about environmental impacts and it's never just about like the hard numbers and data I want to make sure that's that's clear in this conversation um, but I think that we have a lot of work to do in terms of framing how those assessments can even be done and I don't mean quantitative, I mean how are we framing that problem and that question? Um, because I think it's an, an enduring one for how we think not just about new construction and materials that are flowing through the systems, but also, as you rightly point out, the fabric that exists today. And that's where we really come into this fascinating multi-scalar and temporal questions of understanding how materials flow across space and time and what those particular trade-offs are that are not just about the embodied um, carbon or just the embody the potential toxicity of a material but kind of the fullness of what that architectural expression is as designers we should be shaping that question right not just receiving the data from analysis that that I think is a, a huge area for exploration in the future mm -hmm. and I think you know one of the ways that we can shape the question is by kind of getting outside the box um, um, or getting inside the box in the case of adaptive reuse um, and, and I think that, that it's, it's crazy how um, intractable um, the kind of contemporary material palette that's presumed to be, you know, architectural, that's, that as, uh, as, uh, as we heard this morning, you know, the, that's, that's affirmed, the teddy bear, the blanket, um, that's affirmed is that, you know, steel, glass, um, concrete. Um, but if you, so I think part of this project that your question refers to is a sort of a project of historical recovery of materials that um, were once used and still are available, many of them abundantly available, whether that be wood, um, mushrooms, plants, whatever it may be, and thinking of ways um, as, as, as architects that we can actually kind of recover some of those uses or find new uses. And when we recover those uses, we don't just build a log cabin, and we, 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 we um, use um, the natural material or the older material in a way that kind of catalyzes something new. So something always kind of falls out when, when, when we change the wall, when we kind of change the, the, the palette of materials that architecture uses. Hello, I'm Vinay originally from India. Usually when we talk about historical buildings, uh, buildings which have lasted over 2,000 years with little or no damage, despite any attacks of nature or any other forms of we often look at these buildings either from a social, religious, cultural context. What should be done such that these buildings are observed more from a scientific context? Like how have they lasted thousands of years and how have they 
how do they operate with like near zero energy consumption for so many years? Because even in, th there were floods in Uttarakhand in an Indian state, the buildings built like thousands of years ago have stood the floods, whereas the buildings built 10 years ago haven't. So what, what should we do to change the debate and change the view that we are looking at these buildings from a scientific perspective rather than just contemporary history? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, your question is an interesting one because it kind of gets at, you didn't use the word, but it kind of gets at colonialism um, and it gets at um, the, the um, very kind of thin recent coat, you know, thin the last 50 years, um, uh, coating um, that uh, has sort of been exported out, out, of, the United, out of the United States. Um, of this um, modern um, wall system, of this modern construction with its like super, super limited palette of materials. And when that is exported into um, different kinds of climates, tropical climates, wet climates, and so forth, we, you know, it, it has, of course, understandably, completely you know, different results, um, although modern buildings sometimes don't fare well um, here in the United States either. So I think that um, in many countries, actually, um, many, many people are spearheading a kind of a, a recovery um, or a return, if you will, to um, a different set of building materials, but used in contemporary ways, used with computation, used um, you know, uh, brick masonry that, that engages with computation, um, using um, rammed earth, um, using a number of different kinds of materials um, not in a, in a kind of you know, so-called primitive way, but in a way that really blends high and low technologies. And I think that that's super interesting. Thank you very much. Thanks.